All right, Isaiah 63, let's call this one the wine press, understanding that this chapter is going to talk about the wine press of wrath, very similar to what we'll see out of the Revelation in at least two chapters. Revelation 14, roundabout verse 19, talking about the great wine press of the wrath of God. And then likewise, and seeming to foreshadow the return of Christ, it is going to talk about the wine press of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty, in Revelation 19, roundabout verse 15. So it seems that Isaiah 63 is going to foreshadow that in a way. And once again, we're getting toward the end of Isaiah and I'm doing less summarizing. So I'm going to paint kind of a hopefully a general picture of what it seems the chapter is talking about before observing a few points. First six verses, however, are going to talk about that wine press. The second few verses going from seven through roughly 14 are going to give us the backstory of why he is even outraged enough to start pressing out the wine press of his wrath. And then the final few verses, 15 going on through 19, are going to talk about the confusion coming from those who are being trodden out, understanding that they were once good, but now it's come to this and they can't understand why. Understanding that, though, each section might break down a little bit more specifically this way. Uh, that first section talking about the wine press of his wrath shows him first coming from Eden, dressed in verse one in splendid apparel, nice gear. But there's something that the narrator notices, and that is his gear or his clothes are all red, prompting the narrator to ask, why is that? At which point he says it's because he has been pressing out the wine press of God's wrath all by himself. Why? Because as we've seen in a Another recent chapter, he has not found anyone suitable to help him with this kind of work. The chapter then shifting into the backstory where verse 7 will say, I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord. Sounds great, but he's going to talk about the way in which they started out cool or as friends, but it went south because verse 8 or verses 8 and 9 are going to say, For he said, Surely they are my people. Children who will deal, sorry, children who will not deal falsely. And he became their savior. Even more, verse 9, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. Talk about the way in which he was not simply offering them friendship from afar. He was suffering with them. However, it changed. Beginning in verse 10. But they rebelled. Therefore, he turned to be their enemy. But even at that, the rest of that second section going on through verse 14, it's going to talk about the ways in which he still remembers when times were good between them. When, in the days of Moses, he led them out of their frustration, really their captivity. However, that is not going to help them because he is going to leave them, or at least they seem to be left at the end of the chapter. Like we said, verses 15 through 19, offering up a prayer to the one they once despised, asking, why has it come to this? Reminding me of at least a few things. The first six verses talking about the wine press of his wrath, reminding me of a friend who used to say, please don't let this suit fool you. Basically meaning just because he was dressed nice, it did not mean that he was soft. Similar to a familiar phrase we used to say or hear back in the day, popularized in a rap song actually, uh, which is, some people mistake your kindness for foolishness and even weakness. God making it clear that even though his Christ apparently is dressed in nice gear, he is not dressed too nicely to switch gears. The speed with which he switched gears, quite possibly being the reason why they seem caught off guard in the third section, wondering why ultimately reminding me from that middle section in verse 10, why it might say, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned to be their enemy, reminding me of most of the book of Isaiah and how it, along with most of the Bible to this point, has been trying to emphasize the need for us to turn. This chapter making it quite clear that if we don't turn, he will. Building on that concept we saw in chapter 62, that even though he has a salvation and a righteousness of his own. He is talking about the ways in which that offer of salvation is extended to those who order their way rightly. 
quite possibly helping us to see that even though his salvation is offering us a free gift, it is not offering us a free pass. Understanding that the Christ himself offered his free gift of salvation to those who were willing to pursue perfection and do everything he had called them to do. Understanding that mixed in that is, of course, his grace. A great gift. One, however, that never gave us a free pass to ignore his counsel.